have to tell you, uh, I'm going to be totally honest here, I'm an average basketball fan. Uh, I, I, I don't claim to be a huge basketball fan at all, um, but my heart was definitely pounding um, as I was watching this, so I can only imagine how those of you who lived through this or who were real New York Knicks fans felt when you were watching this and what you were thinking. Um, and I do see a lot of kids in the audience. I am certain I know exactly what you were thinking, which is, what's with those shorts? <laughs> right? And the sneakers? It's insane. Um, but I, uh, luckily, we found two really fabulous guests tonight who know a lot more about basketball than I do. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Mo Kassara. He's college basketball analyst and a former Division I head coach. Uh, he, he's provided color commentary for ESPN3, ESPN News, ESPNU, calling games in the ACC, AAC, Big 12, Ivy, MAC, and Patriot Leagues. With nine years of head coaching experience, including five at the collegiate level, he spent three seasons as the head coach of Hofstra University and has served, served as Division I assistant coach in the ACC, excuse me, yeah, the ACC, the Atlantic 10, and the Southern Conference, and has coached three NCAA tournaments as a Division I assistant. And he's played college basketball for three seasons for St. Lawrence University under current Bucknell head coach, Dave Paulson. Mr. Mo Cassara. And I know you all met Harvey Arden at the beginning of the film, but I just want to add some things that maybe he wasn't going to say about himself. Um, he's covered 10 Olympics, Wimbledon, the French Open, the Davis Cup, and has covered many NBA Finals, the World Series, the Super Bowl, and the men's and women's Final Fours in college basketball. He was also, excuse me, he's also been nominated by the Times for a Pulitzer Prize in 1994 and was named 1998 Sports Writer of the Year by the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association as well as many, many other awards. So we are really thrilled. And he wrote the book, When the Garden is Eden, as all of you know. Um, so uh, I'm going to open it up to you two, and, um, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Great. Thank you. How about another round of applause for that movie? That was fabulous, wasn't it? Um, thank you for all uh, being here. I'm glad to be in this position. I could, uh, I was telling Harvey quickly after the film, I could ask him questions as a former coach. Uh, I think for hours. Uh, I think that team, uh, those times are so interesting and, and fun to talk about. So I'm going to open it up to some questions to the crowd in a second. But uh, to start, uh, I'm just going to throw a couple questions uh, Harvey's way and see if we can get some things started. And then we'll get some questions in the crowd. I think one of the first things maybe we could talk about is what is the difference uh, between the book and the movie? Well, first of all, I should explain that when um, uh, the idea was first broached to me uh, about writing a book on the old Knicks. Um, and that's how we always colloquial, colloquially uh, refer to them as the old Knicks. Um, you know, my first reaction was, you know, uh, why? Because as you saw in the film, every Nick wrote a book, and quite a few others. There's a famous book by Pete Axtelm uh, called The City Game. Uh, Bill Bradley wrote a great book called Life on the Run. Uh, so in the 70s, there were, I mean, an incredible number of books written. There used to be an old line that, that uh, people used to say about the, Nick, the old Knicks, like, um, so many books, so few titles. Um, I think it emanated from Boston, you know, which, where the Celtics and, and the Celtic public always kind of resented the attention that the Knicks got. Um, you know, and that was all related. There's no question. I mean, in the book, um, you know, we make clear that the, the Knicks, seven-year run, as Phil Jackson called it, um, doesn't come close to what the Celtics, you know, accomplished winning, I believe it was 11 titles in 13 years or something like that. And, um, but the Celtics at that time were in an NBA that was sort of a mom and pop league. It, it, it you know, they were, they were the third most popular team in their own market behind, the, the, you know, the, the Red Sox and the Boston Bruins hockey team outdrew the Celtics, you know, year after year. Uh, also, Boston was a very racially polarized city, so you didn't get the, the sense of, of unity that you got. And when the Knicks did it, uh, when they came together, and as we, we you know, focused on in the film, uh, sort of Madison Avenue and movie stars got behind that team, and it kind of united the city in a way that no other team, I think, in the city could really do, because let's face it, I mean, in those days, the ABA, the Nets existed, you know, out in some hinterland. Um, you know, they, they barely were on the radar, the ABA in those days, before the merger. Um, and then, um, you know, the Jets had won the Super Bowl, 
But of course, that just really pissed off a lot of the Giants fans. So that was sort of a divided city. The Mets and the Yankees were divided the city baseball-wise. Um, so what the Knicks did was really kind of unify the entire city. So anyway, uh, I'm thinking about this, this possibility of a project, and I'm saying, yeah, so much has been written. So I said to my agent, let me, let me take a week to think about it. And I went back and read one of the books. Uh, it was a diary of the 69-70 season by Dave DeBusher. And in that, uh, in that book, he describes the Cassie Russell-Willis-Reed confrontation in practice. And I had never heard about that before. And he reduced it to basically a single paragraph where he said, uh, Cassie was in Ann Arbor, he got stopped by the police, you know, they thought he was some criminal, he broke out of prison, he came, he was mad, he threw an elbow at Bradley and one of the other white guys, and, you know, Willis said, what are you doing? Uh, Cassie called him an Uncle Tom, and Willis said, you know, I'll be whipping some ass or something like that if you don't get back to playing the right way. And I stepped back and I said, wow, that's a whole chapter. And the, th the reason being is because, I mean, that book was written essentially during the championship season. He was just keeping a diary. So here I am 40 years later with the perspective and the context of, you know, what that time period really was in America. And I started th getting this idea in my head at the time that the Knicks, and, and I should add that I was a kid in Staten Island and I was in high school during those years, and they were my heroes. I mean, I played some basketball. I, I wasn't blessed with much, much height. Uh, but I used to try to wear number 10 because I loved Frazier. Uh, Willis was sort of like the heart and soul of the team. And I started to think about the people that I had known uh, because it seemed like a few years after that season or that run, by the time they won the second title, I was in college. Um, it's like a snap of the fingers later, I was out on the road covering the Knicks and establishing relationships with some of these guys. I think Willis Reed was actually the coach of the team when I when I first started on the Knicks beat for the New York Post. And so I got to know them and you know you say, okay, 40 years have gone by. You know, Phil has gone on to do this, Willis has gone on to do that, Bradley has gone on to run for president, be the senator in New Jersey. Uh, you know, all these different things. Cassie Russell, you know, has gone on to become uh, you know, uh, he's a minister in um, Savannah, Georgia. You can see he has he has his own um, his own uh, what, do, what would I call it? Uh, Church, church, uh, and um, so uh, I, I, that's when I decided I'm going to do the book because it suddenly hit me that what those Nick, what that Nick team was, and in 69, 70, 68, when you you know you had all the turmoil in the country, you know civil rights movement, Vietnam leading into Watergate, you know all the problems, the urban decay. What that Nick team to me represented, as I started to think about it, was sort of a America as it always imagined itself to be. Um, you know, it's sort of like the illusion of the American dream and equality and, you know, and opportunity. And here you had this team um, of, you know, I mean, Bradley comes from a Republican family, although he became a Democrat. His father was a banker. He comes from a fairly wealthy background. You had Willis from the, you know, from the Deep South. You had Cassie from urban Chicago. You had ultimately Jerry Lucas. All these different guys, black and white, you know, um, uh, white collar, blue collar. Um, and it was all about sharing. It was all about democracy. And I started to get the idea that this was sort of like a Broadway play being enacted in a very turbulent time period. Um, and that in itself, beyond the fact that Madison Avenue hooked in, and it, you know, sort of really that team kind of foreshadowed what the NBA would eventually become, sort of the blurring of entertainment and sports, but really that it was, you know, this idealism um, of what the country, we would have liked the country to have been, but was far from it. And, um, you know, I, there are certain things that never made it into the film, which, of course, as the author of the book, uh, disappointed me, but I also realized the limitations of a 75 minute film. But like game five, for example, the night Willis Reed got hurt and went down, that was also the day of the Kent State shootings. And I clearly remember that I scored two tickets. My friend's uncle um, uh, had two extra seats and he had two seats and he couldn't make the game that night. And he gave them to his nephew. And we took the we took the uh, the uh, bus down to the ferry terminal in St. George in Staten Island, and then 
the train uptown. And I clearly remember on the way to the garden, you know, the afternoon, the old afternoon New York Post, you know, you know, Kent State horror on the front page. And it was this kind of an eerie feeling in the building. It was like people almost didn't feel entitled to get passionate and, you know, psyched up about a basketball game when, when something like that horrible had happened in the country. And it was only after Willis went down and the Knicks kind of like, you know, rallied around him or, you know, each other that you almost sensed that people in the building felt entitled to kind of really get excited about this. But there are a lot of things about that, you know, the political aspect that we tried to focus in on the book. Um, Michael did a good job of, in, of bringing it into the movie through Cassie for the most part. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, in summary of the question, it was a long answer, but um, the book is really targeted toward baby boomers, people who experienced it and want to know more or get reacquainted with it. And the film, you know, done by ESPN is targeted, you know, they're sort of an 1834 demographic. So as you can tell from watching the film, it's very fast paced, there's you know, music in it. Uh, Michael couldn't help but insert himself into it. Um, but he's sort of a quintessential New York guy, he sounds like that, so it, it, kind, of, it, it kind of fit. You know? And um, I would say that's the difference, is that the film was targeted to educate young people uh, about what went on those days, where the book was just like almost 400 pages, really gets into the politics, the socioeconomics, and also, the relationships between the players, which really uh, I found to be one of the most fascinating aspects of all. If I could, because uh, as a former coach for a long time, one of the things that I thought was very interesting in the film uh, was Red, was the coach, the backbone, and Phil Jackson now being back with the Knicks. Um, can you talk about the coach a little bit? Because I think in the film, because it is shorter, probably didn't get into him as much. Uh, but I think his impact on the Knicks and New York and the success that they had probably has a lot to do with winning a couple championships. Yeah, well, Red, you know, a lot of people at that point, by the time they were really good, saw Red as this sort of erudite, um, you know, obviously very intelligent guy. Um, those, of the, those people who were around in those days, like Larry Merchant, who covered the games, knew Red had the foulest mouth in the NBA. Um, but in effect, Red was really kind of a street kid, and that's what made him a great basketball coach, because a lot of the, like for instance, he loved Dick Barnett. I mean, I'm not saying he loved him more than, you know, Willis or Walt, but Barnett was sort of like the unsung hero of, the, of those teams, and never, laid, never made a lot of money, uh, because by the time he got to the team, he was a veteran. In those days, African-American players were typically paid less than the white players. And, um, but Barnett, came, when he came into the NBA, he was really a street kid, too. He was from you know, northern Indiana and, um, you know, again, very foul mouth, um, you know, basically a street kid. And I think Red, if you looked into Red's eyes, and I knew him, I covered Red when he came back for a second tour as coach with the Knicks after Willis got fired. Um, and if you looked past Red's age at that point, you know, uh, wrinkles, whatever, what you saw was ba basically a guy who, if you met him on the playground, would take your wallet, your keys, and, and everything else, and he was a real tough guy. And in fact, in the early 50s, the Knicks had a pretty good team. They were coached by Joe Lapchick, and they made it to the finals, I believe it was three years in a row or something, or three, I, I forget exactly what it was. One of those years, they played the Rochester Royals, and Red Holzman was on the Rochester Royals team and made several key plays down the stretch uh, to deny them, it was, I believe it was game seven, deny the Knicks the championship, of course, setting himself up for all the glory several years later. Um, but Red was really um, just a, a real New York City character, wise-cracking guy, but a very humble guy as well. He never took credit for anything. He never um, spoke poorly about his players. Certainly he didn't have much to speak poorly about in those days. But even when he came back to coach the likes of Ray Williams and Michael Ray Richardson, these guys were real kind of, you know, lovable goofballs in their own way. But he would never knock a player publicly. And he'd always say the same thing about a coach. Oh, this guy does a great job. When they refer in the film, when Bradley says he went to the locker room after game seven in Boston, 
uh, where uh, Dean Meminger had that great game. And he says he never saw Red as uh, excited and passionate and he was punching the air. That was because he hated Red Auerbach. I mean, he hated the guy who would light a victory cigar on the bench. I mean, really, in many ways, that was the, that was the original form of trash talking, was this, you know, this very, very immodest coach um, who, you know, was a great coach in his own right, but, you know, essentially would have no qualms telling you how great he and the Celtics were. Um, so Red, being the opposite personality, always resented Red Auerbach, and to finally beat him, and on his home court in Game 7, so I'm, Red once told me over a couple scotches, which was his favorite drink, that that was the greatest victory of his career of all. Um, let's take some questions from the crowd. We have uh, a lot of people here who have lived through a lot of this and, and love it. So uh, take some questions, and we'll, uh, we'll try to uh, get through a bunch of these. Staying on the Red Holtzman uh, description, the movie itself did not portray many of the players giving the coach the credit knowing how to use the players and uh, basically coaching these outstanding teams. Were these parts, were there cuts made, or did the players give the coach credit the way you just explained it? I believe there was one reference, probably from Phil Jackson, um, who idolized Red. And in fact, when he was hurt during the 69-70 season, Red gave him some minor coaching responsibilities, scouting things, you know, putting together charts, things like that. Um, but I think it, Phil's entire philosophy uh, as an NBA coach was developed from Red. And, you know, where they refer to, well, I think it was the, the point where Phil said that when Red came in, um, he took the, the plays that the Knicks had used and kind of made a notion of wiping his behind. I think, I don't think that, um, that was in some ways trying to imply that Red was a sort of a laissez-faire coach and the players just, Red understood, number one, that he had players with very high basketball IQ. That, that became obvious to him as he was coaching that team. But Red also believed that the, being the best coach that you could be was creating um, a unit of players who thought and acted for themselves. And in, in fact, um, Phil went on, there's a great story that from years later, when the Chicago Bulls were playing the Knicks in the year that Michael Jordan took a sabbatical after his father was, was murdered, and they're playing the Knicks in game, I want to say it was game three of the conference semifinals, and the Knicks were, had a, had a, uh, the Bulls had a big lead, the Knicks come charging back in the fourth quarter, and they tie the game with 1.8 seconds to go, and um, Phil calls timeout to set up his last play for the Bulls, and he calls it for the rookie from Croatia, Tony Kukoc. Well, Scottie Pippen nearly had a stroke, and refused to get off the bench and go in the game. Now, none of us who were covering that game even realized that Scottie wasn't in the game because, I mean, all hell was breaking loose. We all were filing our stories on deadline. We had the, you know, the Bulls winning. Now the Knicks are tied. So they call the play, they run a, they run a high screen, Ku coach gets the ball at the top of the key and, and hits a shot, hits a jumper to win the game. The Bulls run off the court and, you know, that's the end of it. Well, we suddenly realized, we're circulated that Scotty wasn't in the game and had refused to go in. Well, what happened, Phil went into the locker room and now the series is two to one Knicks and Phil does nothing, he says nothing. And he waits to see what's going to happen, much the way Red Holzman stood back that day at practice and waited to see what Willis, as the captain, was going to do about Cassie Russell injecting race into their team. Well, Bill Cartwright, who was the center on that team and was a veteran, who in fact had started his career with the Knicks, stood up and with tears in his eyes, looks at Scotty and says, Scotty, how could you do that to us? You're our leader. And Pippen, like, you know, he was cornered, and he had to stand up and apologize to the entire team. And most of the writers, when we found out about it, said he'll never live this down, he'll, his career will ever, always be tarnished. But because Phil let the players handle it themselves, 
they took care of it. And this, the, the, uh, the Bulls won the next game. They took the Knicks to seven games, which was one of the great performances I thought that I've covered over the years without Michael Jordan. Imagine losing a player of Michael's magnitude and then taking your main rival, which had won, I think, 57, 58 games, to seven games. Um, but that's where Phil's philosophy as a professional coach uh, really um, sort of germinated from. And so the point being that, you know, the less is more. I mean, years later in the NBA, when I first started, I was coached UB Brown's te Knicks teams. I mean, UB would do, would do everything but drive the bus. I mean, he'd call out plays on the sideline. He's always running the, you know what I mean? And many players, especially the modern players, didn't respond to that. You know, the players, especially players with high IQ, I'm sure as a coach you know that, they want that responsibility to be able to think for themselves and improvise. And that was, that was a hallmark of those Nick teams and also for Phil's teams um, you know, going forward in Chicago and LA. Great, uh, how about another one over here? Well, that's always the age-old argument um, about the athletes. Of course, the athletes are bigger, stronger. Um, in the book, I remember um, uh, Mark Jackson um, see, running into Cassie Russell at an NBA Finals game in Orlando a few years ago and telling him that his, the teams that he played on with Pat, Patrick Ewing would have killed the old Knicks, and there's too much hype. And, and Kazi and and uh, uh, Kazi said to Mark, "What you been smoking?" <laughs> um, you know, look that Nick team. We knew. You look at their front line. DeBusher was probably six six tops. Bradley was six five. Willis was you know six nine. You know, bulky. Uh, I don't think the guards' play would be any real different. Um, but by the same token, you know, if you put that team in this era, um, you know, you would have guys in the weight room, you would have guys doing more uh, preparation. It was just a different era. Certainly the athletes are better, but I think without dispute, you could say that the fundamental understanding of the game was superior back then. Although I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't like to be one of these guys who always says, oh, you know, back in the old days, because in my mind, the San Antonio Spurs are the epitome of the old Knicks. I mean, they're a wonderful team. And I, in the book, write about how if the Spurs had somehow been transplanted to New York, they, instead of being considered the boring team that the NBA never really wanted to see in the finals, they always preferred to have Kobe and Shaq or you know, people like that, that you know, if they played in New York, they would be hailed as the second coming because Tim Duncan w is Willis Reed in many respects. They had the, you know, they had the, the foreign guys, Tony Parker, uh, you know, newspaper people uh, would be chasing after, would have been chasing after him and his ex-wife, Eva Longoria. So, you know, I think all eras have a handful of great teams, two, three, four uh, teams that could compete in any era. I'm going to interject one question and we can keep it going. One thing I thought was fascinating about the film, and see if some of you agree, as they got better and better, the Knicks, they kept making moves. They kept making a trade. Uh, they didn't just kind of settle for who they had. In your opinion, who, would it, who was the most important acquisition they made? Was it DeBusher? Um, was it Pearl? Who, who, would it, who would it have been uh, during that transition? It, it was always DeBusher. Even they realized it then that it was DeBusher. When they made the DeBusher trade, they traded a guy named Walt Bellamy and, and a guard named, uh, who, was a, who was a center and a guard named Howard Comives to Detroit. And Bellamy, you know, being a center, kind of forced Reed to play the power forward position. And they often ran into each other in the paint, got in each other's way. Comives had a grading personality. There were guys on the team, like Cassie Russell would not pass the ball to Howard Comives. So, when you brought the bush in and then Bradley went to his natural position, everything, it was like pieces to the puzzle that fell perfectly into place. And then all the, you know, the pettiness of professional sports teams that invariably arise and can at any moment. I mean, it almost, it could have destroyed them in Detroit. I mean, I always make the point, and again, it didn't come up in the film, that when 
um, Willis did what he did. The way he handled that was so perfect because he he put Cassie in his place and he made Cassie realize what he had said was horrible to a, a black man who had grown up in the segregated South. And in front of and this being and Willis being the captain in front of the t entire team, he gave he had he gave Cassie enough time to back down and go back to work. Had he basically beaten the hell out of him, and we knew what Willis was capable of because we watched it right. against the Lakers, had he beaten the hell out of him and emasculated him, well, the Knicks likely lose him as a you know as a solid member of that team. So what didn't make the film, unfortunately, was the sort of the, the, the storybook ending for that particular incident. Um, they play the Bullets, who they had swept the previous season, in the first round. And they get taken to game seven at Madison Square Garden. And in that game, Bradley has a terrible night. He's in foul trouble. I think he shot like two for nine. In the fourth quarter, who comes off the bench? The Knicks had a lead for most of the game. The Bullets made a run. Who comes off the bench to kind of save them? Cassie Russell. So it all, you know, again, an example of Willis's wonderful leadership. I'm not saying he consciously thought, like, oh, I'll do this and then this will happen. But it was sort of an, his intuitive leadership that really saved the day for them there. Great. Another question? Javi, uh, being there in the beginning, I was there November 11, 46, the first game the Knicks ever played against the Chicago Stags. And living the dream, I felt there were two names that were instrumental in making the Knicks. One was a guy, Ed Coyle and Paul Seymour. One was the general manager of Detroit, and the other was the coach. And they, they made the Debusha trade. But uh, in the book, can you tell the audience, because it was fantastic, about the game seven and what actually happened. I was there early when Don May was feeding Willis. I got into the garden very early. I sat in my seat in the first row, and Willis couldn't move. He was grimacing in pain. And there was Chamberlain, and there was West, John Tresman, Mel Counts. They were all watching Willis. They couldn't believe it. And Stanley, right? Is that you, Stanley? Stan, that's okay. me. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. He was one of my sources for the book. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, Stan and Freddie. Stan and Freddie were there forever. Stan Osofsky from Great Neck. Okay, very good. So, yeah, Don May, Willis went out early to, you know, try to loosen up and shoot some, shoot some jumpers really before the crowd was in the building. Um, and Don May was feeding him. And uh, May said that uh, he looked over and he saw this head popped over from one of the uh, areas behind the lower stands. And it was Will just out there watching already. And then in the book, George Kalinske, the famous garden photographer, said that he was in the back area by the locker rooms. And uh, Wilt was kind of lurking around, um, trying to find out whether Willis was going to play. And finally, Jerry West came back and said, Will, what the hell are you doing? Come to the locker room. Who cares about them, right? And I think it was. I think the point, you know, all these stories that people tell about Will kind of being transfixed about, you know, Willis and his condition, was that Will was a very bright, um, and, you know, uh, bright, thoughtful, but an analytical guy. Um, but throughout his career, I mean, when he started at the University of Kansas. He was always expected to win. He was bigger, he was stronger, he was better. And he was always expected, you know, if you lose, you failed. So what people don't remember, and we do cover in the book, is that early in that season, Wilt was injured and wasn't expected back. He made his own pretty remarkable recovery from, I believe it was knee surgery. Um, and he came back toward the end of the season. So here's Wilt on on the West Coast, kind of being hailed as heroic. And now, game seven of the finals, you know, and he'd also always lost against Bill Russell, a smaller, you know, smaller center, you know, a left-handed guy who was born in Louisiana. And now here's a 
Russell's finally gone, you know, he's finally rid of Russell. Willis, and now he's up against another left-handed guy from Louisiana, and his injury is even worse than Willis uh, than than Wilts because he's freshly injured. And I think w in in the back of Milt's, Wilt's mind there was this sense I can't win no matter what happens. If I win, they'll say, well, you're you're beating up on a cripple, and if I lose, well, it's because you know I choked. Um, I think it messed with his head. I mean, I think a lot of people will tell you. Spike Lee told me, you know. I was at that game, he was probably 11 years old or something. I was at that game, my neighbor took me, and you know I saw in the eyes of all the Lakers that when Willis came out, they were finished. I said, where were you sitting? He said, oh, about in the third mezzanine. <laughs> oh, really, you must have really good vision to see that, you know, that, they were, that they were defeated before, just as Willis came out. So that's become, a lot of this stuff you know, becomes part of the myth. And in the book, you know, one of the things that you try to do is, is separate the myth from the reality. And there are some things that you do question uh, whether or not, you know, these guys over the years have just started telling these stories over and over again. For a quick, quick one, I asked um, Phil Jackson, we were talking about the Martin Luther King assassination. He said, oh, yeah, man, that was, that was terrible. In fact, we were about to play the... Uh, 76ers, that was the first year we made the playoffs, and we were playing the 76ers at the Spectrum, and Barnett gets up in the locker room and says, man, we shouldn't play. And uh, we, had a, we had a discussion about it, and they decided that they had to play the game. You know, people go to work, you know, something terrible happens. So just to check, I went and saw that, I looked it up, and the Knicks were eliminated from the playoffs like three days before the assassination. So it couldn't have possibly happened. But these guys, you know, they're like an old, they're like an old war platoon. They tell these stories over the years at banquets and reunions and stuff. And after a while, they start to believe them. Oh, well, yeah, as I said, 10 guys came out, and so the crowd, you know, was buzzing and worried and everything, and all of a sudden in the tunnel, a black guy appears and starts coming through the tunnel to come out, and the crowd erupts. Well, it was Cassie Russell. He just happened to come out late. So then everybody sits back down again uh, until Willis came out. The other thing about that, when Jack Twyman, who recently passed away, said that Willis, um, they, we just found out from the locker room that Willis has been shot up with 200 cc's of cortisone. I interviewed Jack about the broadcast, and I think he died just last year, so this was probably about three or four years ago, I interviewed him, and he said, you know, it was, it was funny because I said 200 cc's, he said, that would have killed a horse. <laughs> he said, it was actually 20 cc's, but. <laughs> How about another question? Got one in the back over there? I can repeat it if they can't, got the microphone. I'm just curious to know, uh, in, to, uh, in regards to Phil Jackson, do you think he'll be able to revive the Knicks? And if you believe that, how long do you think it may take him? Thanks. Well, um, you know, I, I try not to handicap too much with these things, because who knows? So much of it is luck. Like, you know, if they had a really bad year this year, this is, this is like one year next spring where they actually have a number one pick. So maybe they luck into a great player. Um, but, you know, I debated back and forth whether or not I thought he should have re-signed Carmelo Anthony. Um, I respect Anthony. He's a, he's, a, he's a scoring machine, but he's 30 years old. He's kind of set in his ways. He's already struggling in the triangle offense. And I kind of thought, like, well, maybe if you have five years, which Phil has five years, he's 69 years old, and if you want to do... Um, if you want to put your own imprint on the team and acquire the kind of players that you feel will best fit into the system that you plan to run, maybe you're better off just letting Carmelo go. Um, you're trying to arrange a deal through a sign and trade, what they call, and starting over, sacrificing this year, um, and then going after the kinds of free agents with a clean slate. Because I'm not so sure there is a, like a whole conga line of free agents who are so anxious to come to New York to play with Carmelo Anthony, who tends to monopolize the ball. So 
if you can mix and match, you know, Mark Gasol is a very good center. He's going to be a free agent next spring. Goran Dragic is a very good point guard in Phoenix who's going to be a free agent. I'm not saying any particular player, but if you have an opportunity to kind of build from scratch and the leverage and the time on your contract to embark on a serious rebuilding plan, um, I think a, a healthy portion of the New York fans and Knicks fans would buy into that. And it's not like to me that Phil is risking anything. I always I wrote when he first came here, he's in a no lose position. His his reputation as the greatest winning coach is in cement. So that no one's gonna say, well, you know, Phil was a fraud or whatever. No one will ever say that. And also, the more the current Knicks fail, the more they, you know, in every new era, whether it's Rick Patino or, you know, Yuvi Brown or Donnie Walsh or Mike, you know, who whoever comes in. Isaiah, and doesn't get the job done, well, Phil Jackson and the old Knicks become even greater in the scope of things. So I thought, like, you know, it was kind of like a 65-35 that Phil should actually start from scratch. The decision he made is based on, you know, confidence in his ability to install stability with this organization, keep Dolan from interfering, and, you know, and give other players out there hopefully you know win 40 45 games this year and then attract a free agent next year the salary cap goes up the year after that with all the new tv money coming into the league and then maybe get another one um so i think you know the debate is not so much about what's right and wrong as opposed to what you just would prefer to see have seen him do a couple more uh how about all the way in the back there uh yes um, I used to uh, coach basketball in the South Bronx, and I happened to have had an, an interaction with Chris Mullen when he was uh, when he was in Brooklyn when he played. For, okay, the point I'm making is a lot of my students they said I don't have to study. I'm going to be in the NBA. I was trying to redirect them to realize that you should have alternatives. What would be? I know it's slightly off slant. I came in late, but as an educator. I'm concerned that so many children out there have one thing in mind, NBA and the big bucks they're going to earn. Could you please comment on that? I was going to say, do you, is that one directed towards me as, as a former coach? <laughs> um, I'll, make, I'll give you a break for a second. I think that's a, a very relevant thing in today's uh, youth, today's kids playing basketball. I've coached for 16 years at all different levels, and so many kids today have great dreams and aspirations, but it's very, very, very difficult. And I think today, pushing kids to school, making sure they do different things, uh, become more well-rounded is getting harder and harder to do because uh, they watch Carmelo Anthony and, and different, uh, they can see them every day on TV and they want to be them. But it's become increasingly difficult. I'll tell you, being a Division One coach uh, for, for years, I can tell you, we call it dealing with the entitled athlete now, um, dealing with the kid that uh, even when they're not playing, still thinks they're going to make money playing basketball. And that's, uh, that's a very difficult thing. I think it's, a, it's something that the game of basketball is struggling with now across the United States. Uh, I think that's why Europe and the rest of the world is caught up so much. Uh, but it is a difficult thing, and it's not just in the South Bronx. It's throughout uh, prep schools and boarding schools and schools throughout the country. Right here in the front. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, um, there is, we do have, I, I do have a segment in the book, not, not a long one, about, you know, the Ewing Knicks and Starks and uh, the Riley era and what that brought to, to the Garden, uh, and it was so close. I mean, um, John Starks, in very similar, you saw the footage of Bradley's shot being deflected by Wes Unseld in Game 7 in 71. Um, same kind of play where Olajuwon rolls off um, off Ewing and deflects Stark's three point three pointer that could have won that series in Game Six, I believe. 
and Starks had the horrible night in Game 7. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny because when I interviewed Peter DeBuscher, Dave's son, who brief, makes a brief, brief appearance in the film, aside from the fact that I couldn't stop looking at him because he looked so much like his father, um, you know, he said to me, you know, I was like two years old. I was born, I, I forget what year, but he was like two years old when the Knicks won the championship. Maybe it was the second one even. And he said that his old Knicks are the Ewing Stark Knicks, Stark's Knicks, and that he and his dad used to um, used to go to all the playoff games and sit, you know, behind the basket together. And that said, they shared a lot of memories. He you know, he has very few memories of it. he has no memories of his father playing other than what he sees on film. <laughs> um, but it's interesting when the Knicks made a second run to the finals in in um, '99. With the Sprewell, Allen Houston, Marcus Camby teams, and Ewing was kind of limping around. Um, I called up Dave, and that team was kind of like, you know, again, a bunch of renegade guys. I mean, Larry Johnson was on that team. And uh, I called up Dave, and I said, um, How would you feel if this team pulled it off? I mean, they were like, you know, if you recall, they were the eighth seed, uh, and they barely got into the playoffs, and then, you know, won the first round in Miami on a buzzer beater by Allen Houston. And I said, how would you feel about this motley crew uh, joining you guys in the rafters of the garden? And he gave me his for the record, um, he, for the record response, which was, you know, my, one of my kids just called me the other day and asked me the same question. And I said, oh, come on, it's, you know, it's, you know, 30 years ago, whatever. And then he said, off the record, and I covered Dave when he was general manager, and he said, he said, these guys can't hold a candle to us, you know. I mean, and he didn't say it in a sort of an arrogant way. He was just that, you know, they really, those guys really do believe that they were part of something ultra special, and they were. Um, which is why, you know, when I decided to do the book, I, the first call I made was to Willis as the captain. And one of the first stories I ever wrote in the New York Post was, from Seattle, and Sonny Werblin had taken over as president of the Garden, and he was um, agitating to make a change. I think Cosell was telling him they, sh you know, they should have never fired the old man. They wanted him to bring Holzman back, and Willis is, was he was considered he was like on the job training. So I asked him a question in Seattle about um, are the rumors bothering you about you know you being replaced. It was, it was like 10 games into his second season. And he said, well, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I have a lot of young guys on the team. They want to know who their coach is going to be. You know, am I in or am I out? Am I in or am I out? And he didn't. So I went back and wrote the story. And the Post, being the Post in those days, well, even nowadays, um, took it and my nice sort of crafted lead written about how it was more of an ultimate, it was more of a plea than an ultimatum was, um, they just rewrote it and said, Willis to Sonny, in or out. Well, three days later, Sonny fired him, called a press conference and said, nobody gives me an ultimatum. Um, so I always wondered through the years, even though Willis always was a gentleman to me when he was coaching the Nets and general manager, always wondered, did he harbor any you know, resentment about that? Because, I mean, that was the job that he really wanted after his playing career. And I called him up, and I had this discussion with him. and. You know, and I and we talked about it, and he said, "Oh, I, I, years later, I realized that Sonny was going to make a change no matter what." And I asked him, "I want to do a book about your your team, um, but I need your blessing. I mean, because the the players still refer to him as a captain, and you know, if Willis says I'm doing the book, that means Frazier's going to do the book, and that means so Willis. I spent five days with Willis down in uh, Grambling, Louisiana. He took me fishing, took me up to his old hometown." I mean, it was a wonderful experience, um, but you know, again, uh, those guys, you know, they really believed that they were part of something great, and I think that's why they also immediately agreed to do the film because who doesn't want to be immortalized, you know, on the big screen? All right, I think we got to we got to kind of cut it off here. We got we got two real we got two hands. If we can make them real quick, we'll do them real quick, and then we'll hustle off. Go ahead, real, real quick. quick. The '73 film. Why was it lost? Well, the NBA, for some reason, back in the old days, um, because it was, again, such a sort of a smaller, much smaller business, they didn't do much 
archiving of film. I mean, they just didn't save a lot. There's not a lot of footage of, for instance, Earl Monroe when he's played, played for the Baltimore Bullets, just snippets, which sometimes he feels you know, remorseful or, or, or regretful about. Um, so you find that, like for instance, when I was working on the book, I was sending out all these SOSs, do you have any game films? And people would send me these old scout tapes, like game five, ga game seven in Boston, the, the, um, the Dean Meminger game. They sent me this hilarious black and white thing that kind of moves fast. And um, sometimes there's play by play, sometimes there's not. The same for game five, um, where Willis got hurt. They just didn't save a lot of film. I mean, what, we weren't living in a world that was as much dominated by video as we are now. I think that's essentially the, the explanation for it's it. It's instantaneous today. Last one right here. Well, actually, um, the point you're making is a good one, but it probably reached its peak, the physical nature of the sport, in the, in the 90s into the early part of this century, when the Knicks and the Miami Heat would play these brutal series where the score would be 71-68. Uh, the, a lot of the art, there was a lot of hand checking, a lot of the art would, was being taken out of the sport. And then, you know, post Michael Jordan, they realized that you know, so many people ignored that because Jordan was such a sort of a luminous character. And at the, in the post-Jordan era, they realized the ratings were plummeting and they started putting in some rules loosening the game up. And now, if you watch teams like the Golden State Warriors uh, play, play up and down, um, the game is a lot more wide open. Also, um, and I'm sure you'd agree to this, that the European, the foreign influence into the sport where the big men don't stand in the lane and clutter it up, they all can go out and shoot, they all, you know, they can pass the ball. So it's kind of created a more wide open, freewheeling kind of game. Um, I don't think it's as wide open as like the old Denver Nuggets teams, you know, when I was first covering the league in the 80s. But um, I find that, um, you know, not every team, but a lot of the teams now are playing a much quicker brand the ball. There's a lot of focus on the point guards and, and running, uh, getting fast break baskets. So um, I think that's, you know, these are cyclical things that kind of swing both back and forth, and but right now it's going in the right direction. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, what a great, uh, another maybe a quick round of applause. What a great thing. And go Knicks. Thank you, Thank you all for coming out.